Hey everybody, it's Professor Davis here to talk to you about electron impact ionization and subsequent fragmentation in mass spectrometry. Now, all MS techniques require that samples be ionized, whether it be by electron impact, chemical ionization, MALDI, or electrospray. Somehow or another, we have to ionize molecules. And the simplest way to do this, or the easiest way to do this, is using electron impact ionization. So you'll find this is a very commonly used technique, but it has limitations, which we're going to talk about. Now, for small molecules, it's probably the most popular method because it's inexpensive, it's easy to build into an instrument. It basically requires that you have a small gap between two electrodes with some kind of carrier gas, usually exiting a GC. Now, during electron impact ionization, a high energy electron strikes a molecule and to keep it simple, let's just say it knocks another electron out of that molecule's electron cloud, almost like two billiard balls striking one another. When the cue ball strikes another billiard ball, they both get some energy and therefore they both move away. So think of it as that. It's sort of a, a game of molecular billiards where we're striking one electron in the cloud with another and knocking it out. So for a cartoon representation, let's take a molecule here in the gas phase. Now that molecule has an electron cloud. And if we shoot this molecule with a high energy electron, it can collide with that cloud, causing the ejection of one electron. Now the result of this is that the molecule loses one of its original electrons. So we end up with a radical cation. In other words, we have an unpaired electron and a positive charge now associated with our gas phase ion. Now, being struck with a high energy electron and left in this state doesn't usually sit too well with the molecules. And so they have a strong tendency to break. And not only that, when they do break, they typically break in predictable ways at functional groups. And these ways usually result in the radical and the cation taking separate sides. It's not always 50-50 as I've depicted here, but you get the idea. So let's take a look at a specific molecule now instead of a cartoon and see if we can make some sense of how this fragmentation manifests itself in mass spectrometry experiments. I'm going to do the example of pentane here. This is a very simple molecule, but one that you may actually ionize and analyze using a mass spectrometer. Now a pentane molecule, of course, has an electron cloud associated with it. So I put some randomly moving electrons here to give you just a vague notion of what it's like. But notice that a high energy electron has just come in and struck one of the electrons in that cloud. The result of this is going to be ejection of both of those electrons. So my net process here produces a radical cation of pentane. I don't know where the radical is. I don't know where the positive charge could be at any point in time, but it's there. And that's what's important in fragmentation. So I've generated my radical cation from pentane. So what happens next? Well, there's a very good likelihood that this entire radical cation is going to survive this process and go to my mass spectrometer's mass analyzer intact. However, there's also a good chance that it will fragment along one of these carbon-carbon bonds. Now I'm going to fragment this for demonstration purposes along one of the exterior carbon-carbon bonds but it could just as easily fragment along one of the interior bonds. And we'll look at both of these processes in a subsequent slide. But for now, let's watch this bond break. Now, when fragmentation occurs in simple alkanes as a radical cation like we've got here, it tends to be a homolytic process. And by that, I mean that the bond breaks in such a way that one electron goes to each side. So in a homolytic bond cleavage, my electrons are going to separate and go to opposite sides of the bond. In the case of a radical cation, what this means from a practical perspective is that the fragments that form are going to have to split the radical and the cation. In other words, they're going to go to one or the other, but not both to the same. So I'm going to, in this case, send my radical to the methyl and my cation to the butyl. Now, I could just as easily have done this in the other way, sending the radical to the butyl and the cation to the methyl. But as we'll see uh, in a future representation, uh, we actually get both of these happening. It's actually the relative stability 
of the cations which form and the radicals which form that allow us to determine how much of each is likely to form during an experiment and therefore how intense the signal is likely to be corresponding to the mass of these fragments. So let's take what we've learned so far about the ionization and fragmentation processes and try to use them to predict how the mass spectrum of pentane might look in an EI mode experiment. So we're going to start from the molecular radical cation, which has an m over z of 72. But this molecular radical cation can fragment at the external carbon-carbon bond or at the interior carbon-carbon bond. If it were to fragment at the exterior carbon-carbon bond, two potential fragment sets could form. The first of which is a methyl radical and a primary cation in the butyl cation. This butyl cation has an m over z of 57. But we could also have a fragmentation process which produces a butyl radical and a methyl cation with an m over z of 15. Fragmentation along one of the interior carbon-carbon bonds will produce an ethyl radical and a propyl cation with an m over z 43 or a propyl cation and an ethyl radical with an m over z of 29. So I expect to see peaks in my mass spectrum which are of mass over charge ratios of 15, 29, 43, 57, and 72, with some isotope peaks thrown in as well, uh, owing to uh, natural abundance of C13 and deuterium. But why is it that some of these peaks are taller than others? Well, if we look at the peaks at 15 and 57, we notice that they correspond to fragmentation processes which produce one methyl fragment and one primary fragment. Whereas the larger peaks at 29 and 43 correspond to those processes which give us two primary fragments, meaning that the set is more stable. And of course our molecular ion at 72 in this case is relatively small because linear alkanes fragment fairly well under EI mode conditions. So using what we know about fragmentation processes and the relative stability of the radical and cation fragments that form, we can start to make some predictions about what a mass spectrum might look like. And indeed, this is a pattern that is very common to linear alkanes, having this sort of a uh, sinusoidal uh, shape to the mass spectrum in which the peaks that break forming more substituted sets of radicals and cations tend to be larger. So this will get you started on your fragmentation analysis, keeping in mind, of course, that the addition of functional groups and branching and cyclization all add new caveats to this analysis. But again, this should be enough to get you started. So good luck with assigning your mass spectra, and I'll see you next time.